This is chapter five, applications of Newton's laws, and we're looking at three important things here. One is friction, the other is the drag, and the third is elasticity. So those are the three things that we're gonna look at in this chapter. Now, what you see there, let me scratch that off. I didn't want you to read the print. What you see there is two surfaces touching each other. And if you look at the two surfaces through a microscope, this is what you're going to see. You know, from the outside, they might appear, or to the naked eye, they may appear to be smooth. But if you look at it through a microscope, look at how the two surfaces are. Are they really smooth here? They're not. Now, that is why there is friction. That roughness that you see there is the reason for friction. So friction is, and friction is always opposite to the motion. If you try to move it to the left, friction will be to the right. If you try to move it to the right, it will be to the left. And friction depends on the nature of the surfaces in contact. It depends on, are you having wood on glass? Is it tiles on a dry road? Or is it tiles after it has been raining? You know what I'm trying to say? It depends on the nature of the surfaces, what type of surfaces. So those are, those are the important things that you have to know about friction. Um, oh. Knee joints. Has anybody experienced pain in the joints at this young age? Are you uh, once in a while, right? Or is it always? It's all the time. Mm. One of the reasons may be too much friction in the joint. Because you know that there is a fluid that lubricates the joints. Did you know that? When you get older, uh, that fluid becomes less in quantity, and so there is less lubrication, and there's greater friction. But this might be a special case, like we all have special cases, right? But I hope it's not too much. Is it? When the weather changes, it hurts really bad. <laughs> okay. So that's, again, friction, as you can see. Friction is reduced. How do you reduce friction in a motor car? I mean, how do you reduce friction? What do we use? Do we use anything to reduce friction in the engine? Of course. Did you know that we use oil? <laughs> Did you know that if it leaks out, that's the end of your precious machine? So friction is always reduced using lubricants. Have you heard of grease? Have you heard of ball bearings? You know what ball bearings are? Because which friction is greater, sliding or rolling? Oh, think about it. Which type of friction is greater? Sliding friction, you know, when two surfaces slide against each other, or is it when they roll over each other? When is the friction greater? Sliding. Therefore, if you use ball bearings, tiny steel balls, then you are changing sliding into rolling. You know what I mean? So that is how friction can be reduced. Okay. Again, friction, drag, and elasticity. Those are the three topics here. We're talking about friction now. See, I can write neatly. Do you see that? Okay, thank you for... And uh, friction depends on the normal force. Do you know what normal force is? Is the weight of an object always equal to its... always equal to the normal force? Yes or no? Is the weight of an object always equal to the normal force? The answer is no. If you have an object on a plane surface, a horizontal surface, its weight is acting down, right? How is the normal force acting? Always at right angles to the surface. In this case, the weight and the normal force are equal. But if I incline it, what's going to happen? Will the weight change? No. The weight is always mg, vertically down but the normal force changes. Does that make any sense? Now, what does friction depend on? Does it depend on the weight or does it depend on the normal force? It always depends on the normal force because it shows you 
how much it presses together. As you can see from these two diagrams, look at the two. On the first one, or the top one, the normal force is small. And therefore, they do not press down so much. See this? But in this one, it's a large normal force, so they press down together more than before there is greater friction. That should make sense. So friction depends on the normal force. If we try to study the relation between applied force and friction, what do I mean by applied force? OK, there is an object here. I try to move it by blowing. Can I do that? I mean, will it move if I blow? You can try. I can try, but I'm sure it will not. Will it move? No. Wait, am I applying a force when I blow? Yeah. Yes. But why isn't it moving? Because the friction between the surfaces is greater than the force that I'm applying, right? So imagine a case where I slowly start increasing the force. Not by blowing, but let's say I increase it, it's not moving. Again, I keep increasing, it's not moving. But at a certain point, it begins to move. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means the force that I applied became equal to the friction, or maybe just greater. Now, there are two types of friction. The friction before it starts moving is called a static friction. But the friction after it starts moving is called a kinetic friction. The words are important, static and kinetic. Does that make sense? Now, which means that if you draw a graph between applied force on the x-axis, the force that I am applying is on the x-axis, friction is going to be on the y-axis, you are going to get a graph like this. Now, FA shows applied force, and this shows what? What is that? What is, what is on the y-axis? Friction. Let's talk. Wake me up. OK. What do you see? When the applied force is 0, what's the friction? 0, 2. But as I start increasing the applied force, see what's happening? Friction is also increasing. And this is the maximum value of static friction. You see that? That is called limiting friction. So the maximum value of static friction is called, it's a limit, isn't it? It's a limit. It's called limiting friction. Limiting friction. The maximum value of static friction is called limiting friction. Hold on. But what happened after that, as it began moving, what happened to the friction? Did it increase or decrease? It decreased. And this is called kinetic friction. So am I right if I say that kinetic friction is always less than static friction? Just a simple yes or no? Alejandro, what do you say? <laughs> am I right in saying that kinetic friction is less than static friction? One practical application of kinetic friction being less than sliding friction is something that you have seen, something that you will never forget after I say it. Uh, especially in Texas, if there's at least a little sleet on the roads, we have a lot of accidents. Because we're, we're not used to driving in those conditions. And we do not know the physics. So what we do is, mm, it's the same car, it's the same me, and you start going. You do not know that friction is considerably reduced now. Then I say that friction depends on the surfaces in contact? Mm -hmm. We're going to see that even if it rains, friction goes down a lot. Now, if it's sleet, friction goes down by 80%. People don't realize that. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. Have you noticed that once the tires start skidding, you don't stop? Have you seen that happen? Maybe you have at least seen videos of that. Once it starts skidding, you know what I mean by skidding, you know, the driver can do anything, it won't stop. The reason is kinetic friction is less than static. All right, look at this. 
when you are normally driving, is it static friction or kinetic friction that's making the car move? Now be careful on this. The tires are gripping the road, isn't it? Gripping the road. They are not slipping. Is it slipping? No, it's just gripping and pushing you forward. So what is that? It is static. But once it begins to skid, it's no more static friction. What is it? Kinetic. And kinetic is less than? Static. So all, you already lost it. When you start skidding, friction has become less. Now there's no way you can get it back. That's why you should never skid. Well, they are trying to do it. Nowadays, we have anti-skid brakes, isn't it? But that doesn't help if you just jam on it. Yeah, just recently. Friction. Uh, this is that part is static friction. This is kinetic friction. And uh, kinetic friction, FK, is less than static friction. I've been trying to say that like 10 times now. Yes? What, what is that vertical line? The yeah, vertical that, line is an axis. Static to kinetic? Oh, that is where the static friction suddenly dropped. You see that? It went down. As it begins movement, before moving, that's the friction. After it begins to move, it suddenly falls. You see, it decreases. That's what it shows. And then it stays the same, kinetic friction state, as long as you're moving. All right, now let's get a formula for static friction. Who knows? What does friction depend on? Surface and normal force. And the normal force, right. Surface and the normal force, right? Two factors. Okay, let's look at this. This is the formula for static friction less than or equal to mu s. That's a Greek letter, mu. It is called the coefficient of friction. And that depends on the nature of the surfaces. That is the factor that shows what kind of surfaces are touching. And what is this? Normal. The normal force. Yeah, so mu s is called the coefficient of friction, or in fact, coefficient of static friction in this case. That depends on the surfaces again. And that is the magnitude of the normal force. Magnitude means just the size, okay? How much the normal force is. Didn't any of you think that friction depends on the areas touching each other, on the area of contact? Surface. Yeah, didn't you think, or do you still think? I don't know. Do you still think that if I move this this way, so you can see, right? And then this way, the area of this is bigger when it touches, right? Don't you think that the friction would be greater then it's more area touching, what do you say? Yes. But the answer is no, because you do not have the area there. In the formula, you know, so those guys, when they, you, haven't you seen those guys, crazy guys, drive those trucks with giant tires, have you seen those? They think probably that friction for them is greater than for the Honda Fit. <laughs> Or the Yaris, isn't that a yeah, 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 whatever. So those tiny cars, you know? No. Friction does not depend on the area. Well, the giant tires have other advantages of stability. We'll come to that later on, right? But when it comes to friction, it does not depend on the area of contact. Does that make sense? You touch it this way, or this way, friction is the same. That's not what students think. Students say, greater touching? There must be more. No. That's one mistake that students make. That's static friction. Now, when it comes to kinetic friction, the formula is the same, exactly the same. Look at it. Kinetic friction, except that instead of Fs, you will have Fk, and you have mu k. Now, it's called the coefficient of kinetic friction. And then it's the normal reaction. Yes? In that previous formula, you didn't have Fk equal to. Uh, oh, I had less than or equal to. Which is why? Somebody. She, she pointed that out. She's good. Yeah, I, no, no, no. That was not the reason why it was. What you said is true, but 
Did you notice that static friction slowly increases all the way from zero and then gets to a maximum? No. So I cannot say it's equal to. I can say it's less than or equal to something. Does it make any sense? But did you also notice that kinetic friction is just the same? So now for kinetic friction, I can say it is equal. Got it? Static friction can be zero. Yes or no? Yeah. Correct. And static friction can grow and become something. So I have to say less than or equal to something here. No. Good question. I would not have even thought about saying that. That's why you have to respond in class. That's why you have to talk. All right. Mu S and mu K. Let's compare these two. And you will be surprised. Rubber on concrete. I'm going to compare both values for this. Watch. Ooh, look at the difference. Rubber on concrete, we're talking about tires on the road, on concrete, mu S is 1, mu K is 0.7. Do you like to drive on concrete roads? I don't, because that's that noise that comes when you go, the joint between the concrete slabs. But, but you know why? We have to have concrete because coefficient of static friction is higher. Is that? It's 1. All right, let's go. If it's dry, if it's wet, if it's been raining, dang, 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 just watch these numbers now. If it's raining, be careful because static friction has gone down to 0.7 and kinetic has gone down to 0.5. That's a big drop. Don't you think so? Guys, that's 30% less. Are you with me? Yeah. 30% less. So if it rains, be careful. Bone. You need that. Is that called the synovial fluid? Maybe you yes. didn't know that. Okay. And wow, wow. Look at the friction. It's so, so what? So what? So small. That's why you move it. You don't hear that noise, except when you get very old. If you move the joint, you can hear. The fluid is considerably reduced. You see? Compare. Compare that, 0 0.016, man. Teflon, have you heard about those non-stick pans? Oh, everybody's. Non-stick pans? You don't know what I'm talking about? Cooking pans? Non-stick, and the coating is called Teflon coating? Okay, look at the friction. Whew. 0 0.04, that's why it just comes off. Mm you know what I'm trying to say, but research shows that every time you cook, a little bit of the Teflon gets stuck onto the food and goes in. Mm -hmm. Makes you think. Shoes on ice. Be careful, okay? <laughs> Shoes on ice. You see the kinetic friction? Try walking on ice. Good luck to that. So those are some of the values. I thought if I throw the values there right before you, you would get interested. Are you? OK, that's it. Now you come to the part that you do not like. And you know what you're going to try to do? You're trying to copy it. Don't do it. Let me explain it completely, slowly. Then you can get it, step by step. Because if you understand this, you understand everything. If you don't, I'm going to grab that. You're going to lose it, like in high school. OK, Let, let's look at this diagram carefully. You cannot cram, so watch this carefully. There are actually four forces. The first force that you would begin with is the weight, always. And how do you, what do you know about weight? Weight always acts vertically downwards, isn't it? OK, so draw it straight down. And weight is mg. Don't draw it now. Try to understand. Now, didn't I tell you that friction is always opposite to the motion? Yes. So the, since this person is trying to go down, friction would be up. Would be along the plane, up. And we know that the normal force, by definition, is going to be at right angles to the surface. Are you with me on that? So this is at right angles to the surface. So we got three forces. Look at them. Friction. Normal force and weight. 
But when you look at those three forces, you say, okay, the normal force is along the y-axis. Do you see the y-axis here? The friction is along the, help me out, x-axis. But this guy is neither along the x nor the that is why we want to break him up into two components. So you must know which one we break always. It's not like blindly doing it. Don't do anything to friction and this because they're already okay. One is along the x-axis, the other along, along the y-axis. So you try to break this up. You look at this angle as 25 degrees. So when you resolve this, this angle is again going to be 25. Do you see that? And therefore in this right angle triangle, this becomes the, what is that? What side is that? MG. Adjacent side, therefore it becomes mg cos theta. And this is the opposite side to that angle, so it becomes mg sin theta. And this is the same as this. You see the directions? Okay, that's all. It is not so tough. Now you can draw it. I'll give you time to draw it. Tell me the forces that act along the y-axis. We'll make it a point always to look at the forces along the y-axis, okay? What are the two forces along the y-axis? Normal force and mg sine theta. What? Normal force and mg cos theta. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. mg cos theta, correct? Now tell me one more thing. Is this person going anywhere along this direction? No. So what do you know about these two forces? They cancel out. They cancel out. That means they must be equal and opposite, right? That's why I've written this. Look, I know n is equal to mg cos theta, and I told you why. Because the person is not accelerating along the y-axis, right? You can write that down. You can write that down. Come on. And after you write that, Tell me the forces along the x-axis. And be careful. What are the forces along the x-axis? Friction. Friction and mg sine theta. And what do you think? What do you think? Which Are these two equal to each other? No. no, because the person is going, which is downward, isn't it? So which one of these two forces should be greater? OK, so when you take the net force, what are you going to tell me? The net force. Mg sine theta down, friction up. What is the net force? Friction. Uh -uh, what do you mean by net? Net means total force. What's the total? Mg sine theta, Mg sin theta minus. Friction. What? But why minus? Because because Correct. I mean, we can make this stuff, but it's not really so tough. Mg sine theta minus friction should be equal to. What's the, what is Newton's law? These two chapters depend on Newton's law. What is Newton's law? Maybe you forgot that. Net force is equal to mass times, mass times acceleration, isn't it? Okay, now we got the net force along the x-axis. You told me mg sine theta minus f, isn't it? So that should be equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration along the x-axis. Come on. Net force is this. is always equal to mass times acceleration. Write it, write that down. Because I don't I do not have all the steps there, so I'm writing more than what you see on the screen. Okay? And then I can go back and say force. Do you know that friction what is that? Friction. I mean friction isn't friction. Wait, what friction are we talking about? Static or kinetic? Kinetic. Kinetic, because it's moving. Right? It's moving. So although I've not shown the K, I think I have, it's FK. And don't we know that FK is mu K times N? So in this formula, I'm going to substitute for F. I'm going to say Mg sine theta minus, that's friction, and I know friction is mu K times N is MAX. Not a big deal. I just substituted for friction. Right? Come on. In place of friction, I just wrote the formula for friction. And then the last thing I can do is to substitute for N. Okay, somebody tell me what is N? It's up on the board. Mg sine theta 
minus mu k, what, what's n? Uh, mg cos theta. Yeah. Yes, because when we looked at the y forces, we got n as mg cos theta, didn't we? Uh -huh. Okay, so that's the final substitution. So mg cos theta is equal to n times a x. Finished. So first I substituted for friction, then I substitute for n. That makes sense? Can I, can, Jonathan is shaking his head and saying no, why? mg sin theta minus mu k n. What is n? mg cos theta. Okay. Can I cancel the mass? Because it's in all the terms. Can I cancel the mass? Yes. And what do you have on the right hand side? That's a beautiful equation. What's that on the right hand side? Acceleration along the x axis. That's what we're trying to find. That is the lab for today. You're going to have something like this, and you're going to roll something, and you're going to calculate the acceleration. You're going to do it in the lab. Hello? Let me see whether you understood. This is a very important formula. And if I say in the lab that today we are not considering friction, I mean, we're not just considering friction today because the surfaces are almost frictionless, then what happens to this formula? How does it change? If there is no friction, how does this formula change? Sin acceleration equals zero. No. 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 Okay, because where is the friction component? I mean, where is the friction term? Mu, mu, mu k and mg cos disappear. Correct. Because, and that is because mu k becomes zero. Right. If there is no friction, this term becomes zero, right? Therefore, this whole term disappears, and you would have what? Ax is g sine theta. Correct. Isn't it? Actually, in one of the, uh, I, mean, I think one of the questions in the lab is, does the acceleration depend on the mass? What do you say after you see this formula? Does the acceleration depend on the mass? No. In fact, when you do the lab, you're going to have different masses, you know? And don't be surprised, you're gonna get the same acceleration because we just proved that acceleration depends only on the angle. Okay, wait, how does it depend on the angle? In the lab, first you're gonna have it at a bigger angle and then you're gonna reduce it slowly. What do you expect to happen? Will the common sense, will the acceleration go down or go up when you reduce the angle? It'll go down. Okay, what about if theta is zero? So how is that surface now? Isn't it perfectly horizontal? Yes. And if theta is zero, sine zero is? Zero. Zero. Therefore, acceleration is? Zero. Correct, expected. Because you don't expect this thing to start sliding on its own. You go crazy. <laughs> now, another thing, another thing. What if theta is 90 degrees? 90 degrees, ooh. Now, that means it doesn't even touch the surface, isn't it? Yeah. It's a free fall. Okay. Sine 90 is 1. Therefore, what do you get? A is equal to G. Good. OMG. Did you understand? A is equal to G. If it's freely falling, its acceleration is 9.8. So for all other angles, the acceleration is going to be less than 9.8. So in the lab, when you do it today, if you get the acceleration as like 15.2, you should hit your head hard and say, I did something wrong because the maximum is 9.8, the minimum is zero between the two. It's going to take numbers between zero and 9.8. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Physics is understandable. It is. Drag forces. What do you mean by the word drag? Is it, uh, I mean, what, what do you think? Is it? Helping the motion or is it opposing the motion? What comes to your mind? Okay, so drag. What is the drag? Friction. Friction is a drag, but since we have already considered that, we're not going to talk about that here, right? Actually, friction is a drag. We are going to chiefly talk about air resistance. When you're moving on the freeway, 
Did you know that 50% of the fuel is used up to go against the air? Did you know that? Hmm. 50%. Although they have tried to give streamlined shapes to the cars. Have you seen that? Have you seen the shape of a fish? Yeah. Oh, that's the best shape. It cuts through water and the water doesn't even move. Have you noticed that? It's like, because of the shape. Now you try to put your big hand in water and try to move it. What do you see? <laughs> Whew. That, it flashes. So that is, that's not a streamlined shape. Look at the shape of a rocket. So already when I'm talking, you know that the drag force depends on the shape of the object, right? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, what else do you think it'll depend on? I'm not going to show you the... Will it depend on the density through which it is moving? I mean density of the substance through which it is moving? Watch. Mm -hmm. Is there drag force on my hand now? Yes. yes. What if I move it through water? Will it be the same drag force? No. It'll be greater or smaller? Why? Because the density of water is much greater than the density of air. So it depends on the shape. It depends on the density of the substance. What else? Does it depend on the area? My hand is quite big, not very big. But if you bring somebody's hand, like Hannah's hand is small, I think, and she moves it through, I mean cute. Not <laughs> okay, move it through water. Will the friction be the same? Will the drag be the same for both her hands? Where will it be greater? Where will it be greater? Is it where the area is greater or smaller? Greater. greater. So it depends on the geometrical shape. It depends on the density of the substance. It depends on area. area. <laughs> okay. It also depends on something that you will not believe me. When you drive on the freeway, did you know that to conserve fuel, the best speed is around... 50 miles per hour. Well, I know we cannot do that sometimes, where the speed limit is like 60 and we, 65, you know, we have to go. But the optimum speed is 50 miles per hour. What am I saying? I'm saying that drag force also depends on the velocity of the object. Let's see the formula. Suspense, too much suspense. Drag force, this is the formula. One half C rho A B squared. Let's look at the terms. We talked about all those. C is called the drag coefficient. It depends on the materials. Again, A is, guess what? What's A? Area. Okay, thank you. Why did you see P? Yeah, that's not P, that's rho. That's Greek, the symbol for density. I thought you meant P squared. No. Density of fluid, and that, that is, of course, the speed or velocity. Did you see that the drag force depends on how many quantities? Let's see whether you can count. How many quantities here? Four. Does it depend equally on these four? No. no. Which one does it depend most on? Velocity. Why do you say that? Because it's square. Thank you. Very good. So when you're driving... Don't be a fool. Where the speed limit is 50, go at 50. That's the best speed. If you go at 65, you're losing a lot of money. Go ahead, lose it. I need some. It's only when some people lose that others gain. Did you know that? So we always need crazy people like that. Okay, so that's the drag force. Any questions on that? Uh-huh. It's the model of an airplane. Right? It's not a real one. They have to test it in what's called a wind tunnel. Do you see that there? Yeah. What are they testing for? What are they trying to do to the drag force? Trying to make it small. as small as possible. That's why they have those shapes. Okay. A lot of testing that goes on. Uh, this is, all these pictures are taken from your textbook. This one, what's it called? You can see it there, down there. What's it called? Okay. It sticks to the body. And it's found, I like this, because it produces 10, at least 10% less drag. And it's given them so many world records after the release in 2008. Isn't that good? 10% reduced. So, lots. 
Birds? Who taught the birds to fly like this? Have you seen those birds have this formation most of the time? Because that's the formation when the drag force is the smallest. Instead of going straight like that, they just make that. You see the formation like that? Curved, so the drag force is less, and they know that. And do you know that they keep shifting places too? Watch them when they fly next time. It's not always one here. It goes, and they always have that formation. Who taught them all this? Yes. But why does they have it? I mean, they're individually flying. They are. But as, actually, they are as a group, although they're individually flying. It's the same thing as walking, right? Mm -mm. We cannot understand that because we do not stick so close. As a group, you know, as a group, if you walk so fast, and we're talking about speeds too, right? Yeah. Drag forces are much greater for them because, because they're moving faster. For, the, for us, when we walk, I mean, hey, this is nothing. No speed at all. So drag force is not so much. But if we were running, and if we were running as a group, then it would always make sense to make that kind of a formation. Did that make sense? Okay. Is that walk. way on the track? Starting points are all different? No, that is, uh, that is to make the distances equal because they're going around a circular path. Otherwise, the one that runs on the outside will always have a disadvantage, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. Fine. This is when the class is moving. People are talking now. All right. Uh, yeah, I told you this. At highway, <laughs> I didn't want you to see all that uh, because... Uh, we're going to compare different models of cars and uh, which one do you think is the best one? Anybody who drives a uh, Camry here? Toyota Camry? <laughs> You're going to see now. It's coming up. I told you this, at highway speeds, over 50% of energy is used to overcome air drag. Didn't I tell you that? Yeah. All right, now compare it. Most fuel efficient speed is from 45 to 50 miles per hour. All right, compare them. Toyota Camry. I won't give the numbers until I finish writing down, see? All right. You know, these guys who drive this, they are the craziest. You'll see now. We need some like that because we need money. All right, here it is. Those are the drag coefficients. C values. You know what C is, right? Yeah. Drag coefficients. So the Camry is the best in the group. 0 0.28. Of course, on a bicycle, it's your body, right? Flat. <laughs> so that's why it's so. Skydiving, of course, it has to be high. And that, isn't that what we're looking for? Skydiving? Okay. How many times have you? Um, only twice. Is it exciting? Uh, I mean, of course. For me, for my, I went with my best friend for my 21st birthday. <gasps> you also gave us your age. Yeah. <laughs> from one topic to the other. The raindrops as they come. From how high do you think the raindrops come down? Is it just above our heads? No. <laughs> no. So, no, no. Wait. If you look at a raindrop and keep listening. If it was accelerating all the way until it hit our heads, don't you think it would have been moving so fast? Mm -hmm. And the momentum, which is in our next chapter, would have been so high that it would have really hurt you. Mm -hmm. It would have been like somebody throwing stone at you on your head. Ooh, now, why doesn't that happen? Because as the raindrop comes down, what's happening to the drag force? Increasing. Why is it increasing? Why is the drag force increasing? Because the, listen, because the velocity is increasing. Didn't you see that the drag force depends on the square of the velocity? Mm -hmm. So now the weight is the same, it's coming down, but at one point the drag force has become equal to the weight. Mm -hmm. Is that understandable? Mm -hmm. So what's the net force now? The weight. The weight, see when it begins the journey, when it begins the journey, what's the drag force? Somebody. It's not yet falling. What's the drag force? Zero. 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 As it continues, it's picking up speed. So what is happening to the drag force? Increasing. So at one point, 
for a particular speed, the drag force has become equal to the weight. Is that understandable? Mm -hmm. Now what is the net force is my question. When the drag force up became equal to the weight down, what is the net force? Zero. Zero. That means the acceleration is? Zero. That means the velocity will not increase anymore. So until the end of the journey, the velocity will be the same. That's why it's called the terminal velocity. Have you heard of this? That some guy has a terminal sickness? Have you heard of that? What does that mean? Okay. Correct. That means that's the sickness that will take them to the end, unfortunately. So the word terminal means up to the end. All right, terminal velocity. And I told you, mg is equal to fd. Put them equal to each other. Drag force is equal to the weight. And we know the drag force is given by this formula. Therefore, make the velocity, the subject, and you get this. I'm just calculating that for a mass of 75 kilograms. It's kind of a problem there. Do you see that? I've just imagined there's an object of mass 75 kilograms. G is 9.8. That's the density of air, 1.21. This is the drag coefficient coming up. And the area of the object is 0.18. <coughs> the terminal velocity is about 98 meters per second, which is 350 kilometers per hour. So if you have been falling, that's the kind of mass of a person. Head first, you jump off. Head first, this would have been your speed. That's scary, isn't it? 350 kilometers per hour? Come on. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So that would have been our terminal velocity. No, we cannot stand that. So don't say, oh, yeah, that's okay. If we reach the ground with this velocity, you will not exist anymore. That's why a long time before that, you have to open the parachute. All right. You got it? When I ask you, what is elasticity? Yeah. Go ahead. Perfect. So you mean if you have, uh huh? Okay, so if you pull something out like a rubber band, mm -hmm. and then you let go, it'll come back to its original condition, right? Isn't that what you mean by elasticity? Come on now, or drop a rubber ball on the concrete floor. So with that idea in mind, if I ask you this, is steel? Is it steel or rubber? which is more elastic, if I ask you this question. Steel, you know what steel is, and rubber, compare them, which is more elastic? Rubber. You would always say rubber. But actually, steel is a million times more elastic than rubber. Now, this is where the unlearning part comes in. Our idea of elasticity is wrong. Because our idea is, you apply a small force, it goes, but actually, elasticity is in the second part. When you let go, is it coming back to its original condition? If you stretch a rubber band 10 times, you know what happens to its length finally? <laughs> will, it, will it be the same length as when you started out? No. That means it's not elastic. But you do this to a steel cable. When you do it to a steel cable, you, can actually, you cannot even see it extending because the extension is... Really small, but believe me when I say it extends a little bit and you remove the force, it goes exactly back to where it came from. How many understood? Let me see your hands. That's why we use steel ropes in a crane. Have you seen? We never use rubber. That's why we build bridges using steel and not rubber. You build a rubber bridge, I'm not going there. I'll swim. Have you understood? So change this. You got the idea? Which material is more elastic doesn't depend on how much it stretches. It depends on how quickly and how much it returns to its original condition. Right? There are many types of elasticity. We only have to study one. Okay. And this law is called Hooke's law. Simple law that states that, that look, if you apply a bigger force, 
Don't you think that the material will stretch a little bit more? No. Come on. Sure. So what is this? What is delta L here? What is that? That is the change in length. Isn't the force applied proportional to the change in length? Mm -hmm. That's what you have. So that's how much it stretches. That is a constant. K is a constant. F is the force applied. And the graph would look like this. Watch this part. Surely the graph has three parts. Try to understand. In this part, it's proportional. Do you see that it's a straight line up to this point? And if you keep applying a bigger force, think about a rubber band. If you, if you apply a force and then let go, it'll come back, right? If you apply a bigger force, what's going to happen? It will not come back when you let go. And if you apply even bigger force, it's going to crack. This is the part that happens just before it breaks. These, you know the meaning of fracture? Mm -hmm. means break, isn't it? Just before it breaks, see what's happening to its length. You see that the length is drastically increasing. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what one part becomes thin? Come on. And then it goes, eh, that's going to break, right? So that's, that's what the graph is. Remember that on the x-axis, you have the force. On the y, you have how much it stretches. Is that understood? Mm -hmm. Okay. Simple graphs. Here you have three materials. Read it. Everybody can read the same force. In this case, a weight is applied to three different guitar strings of identical length, same length, produces three different deformations. If you can see the change in length, you can see that change in length here? Okay, do you see the change in length? Isn't it different for each one? It's the same weight. Why the string on the left is thin nylon, the one in the middle is thicker, the same material, and on the one on the right is steel. All right, so what do you think? Both these are the same material. Do they stretch the same? Do they stretch the same? No. So don't we know that the stretching depends on the radius? Come on. The thicker the string, the smaller it will stretch. That's common sense. Right? Okay. Does it depend on the material? Now look, these two... These two, they have the same radius. Are you watching? Yeah. But the materials are different. Which one stretches more? The oh, no, no, I mean, which one stretches more? The left one, the, left one, the nylon one, right? Yeah. Therefore, now we also know stretching depends on the material. Did you hear me? Stretching depends on the material. It depends on the radius. Are you with me? Yeah. Well, again, common sense. Will it depend on the force applied? Will it depend on the force applied? No. I mean, if you apply a bigger force... Don't you think it'll stretch more? Yeah. So it'll depend on the force applied. It'll depend on the radius. It'll depend on the material. And finally, you will come up with this formula. Write it down. Stretching is given by this formula. And I'm explaining the terms. On the left side, you have how much it stretches. On the right side, okay, somebody tell me, what's F? Force, force applied. What's A? Uh-huh, the area. How do you calculate that for a circle? For most cables, it is a circular cross-section, isn't it? What's, anybody knows the area of a circle? Very good. Pi times the radius squared, right? Pi r squared. Okay, so good to write that. What is this? So the stretching also depends on the initial length. Because if you have a small one, it'll stretch less. If you have a big one, it'll stretch more, don't you think so? Yeah. Come on. So how many factors have we got now? Depends on the material. That's what this constant is. Look, this constant that's coming up, you see, that is called the Young's modulus. That's the name of the scientist, Thomas Young. So it's called the Young's modulus. Have you heard of modulus? M-O-D-U-L-U-S? Okay, the word means we do absolute value. Have you heard of absolute value? Oh, so we don't care about whether it's increasing in length or decreasing? It's just how far away it is. Correct. Whether it's, we're just interested in the change, all right? Okay, so that is what it is. Everything explained. Force, original length, cross-section area, Young's modulus. And I just wrote for steel, for steel, you know that steel has the highest GPA 
our GPS cannot go more than four, but remember this is not that GPA. This stands for giga pascals. Have you heard of giga? Giga means 10 to the power nine. Write it somewhere. You see that next time you say, what is that? I don't have that big a GPA. Mine is only 1.5. No, I'm playing. <laughs> Okay, 210 GPA, giga pascals. Right? Any questions on this? We're done. Now, when you're asked to do problems, it'll be direct. Do you see that there's no sign, no cost, nothing? It'll just be everything given except one. Can you find it? I mean, if all the terms on the right side are given, can you find this? Yes. There may be differences. For example, you may not be given the force directly. Listen to this. Maybe the problem says there's a 10 kilogram mass attached. What's the force? Is it 10? 10 15? If there is a 10 kilogram mass attached, blah, 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 the problem continues. What's the force? <laughs> That's 10 kilograms. That's not force. MG? Correct. Force is always mass times acceleration to gravity. That's one thing you have to remember. Students forget. There are 10 kilos. I don't care. You just put it. Put everything. Whatever is given, just put it. Bundle it and get a wrong number. Don't do that. Look at each term. Say, is this force? No, this is mass. Think. Just a little bit of thinking will save you. Thank you so much. I hope this really helps you.